My name is Taylor Clements. I'm 14 years old. I live in Santa Barbara, California. And um, I'm a ninth grader at high school. And I've been straightish for about a year and a half. Well, my grandpa died from a drug overdose, so that kind of made me not want to do drugs or drink. And my dad used to get drunk a lot, so I wasn't too into that. And then uh, my sister and brother decided to be straight edge, so that's how I was introduced to that. And so I just decided that's just like kind of another way of um, like making a commitment not to do that stuff, so I decided to be straight edge about a year and a half ago. When I got into punk in 1979, um, what was immediately like compelling was this idea of deviancy, that punks were different, and that they rejected conventional ideas about any number of subjects. Um, and as somebody who felt like a deviant, because I didn't get high, like almost all of my friends in high school, I felt like I fit right in. But I was surprised to find out that so many punks, people who I thought would be respectful of sort of differences and different ways of looking at things, I felt quite respectful towards their ideas, that they were very derisive. They made fun of us too. They made fun of like the straight kids. Um, so when my threat started, I decided to up the ante, and I wrote the song Straight Edge. This was 1980, and it was a song to all these people saying, hey, like, you're making fun of us, 
and you're giving me shit for being straight. But essentially, I'm just like you. The only thing that's different between me and you is that, and then I went through this list of things. I don't need a crutch, no. I don't do this, I don't do that, whatever. But mostly, if anything, if there's a difference, I guess I have a little bit of an edge because I'm actually present, you know, and I'm taking responsibility for my actions. I didn't know it at the time, but it set off like a firestorm with punk rock kids around the country. And they'd want to confront us, like, you know, who are you to say we can't do, we can't drink? I said, I didn't say that. Never have I said that someone couldn't drink. And then I wrote out a step, which was this really, like, furious sort of follow-up to In My Eyes. The lyrics say, don't smoke, don't drink, don't fuck, at least I can fucking think. The impl Im implication is, I don't do this, and I don't do that, and I don't do this, but I do this. But many people heard it as a set of three directives. Don't do this, don't do that, don't do that. Which is not ever what I was trying to say. When I came into punk rock music or alternative music, I just wanted to be different than the kids I went to school with. I went to school in Connecticut. And um, I just wanted to be different than all these kids. And all the kids were really into partying. And whenever they were like, you know, they were into partying and rock and roll and, you know, crappy metal and crappy acid, 70s acid rock and Led Zeppelin and ACDC, and I hated all that shit. And for me, I was like, I don't want to be anything like these people. I don't want to wear their clothes, I don't want to look like them, I don't want to have this small town mentality. So I lived, you know, an hour from New York City. All my older brothers and sisters lived in New York City. My parents are from New York City. So I said, I'm just gonna go to New York on the weekends when I was 14 and 15. So me and about two other friends um, we'd go on the train and then we found CBGB's. We started going to punk shows there. And the more I got into punk, the more I realized that these punks were a bunch of dirtbag, drug-taking, smokers, drinkers. They're worse than the guys in high school. They're just in a dirtier set of clothes. 
you know, or they have a crazier haircut. So I came into it as an alternative, and then I realized that these hardcore guys, they're, they're just as bad, if not worse. I mean, when I was going to the hardcore scene in New York City, they weren't drinking keg, like in high school, they were all, they have, the big cool thing was you get a keg, and you set it up, and you have a keg party, and you invite all your friends, and the football team shows up, and then the cheerleaders show up, and then you're, you know, you're, you're pumping out beers and drinking beers, and then you take the beer like this, and you poke a hole, and you, ah, you call that a shotgun. You shotgun the, the brew down. And I thought that was just stupid. But when I, was, when I started hanging out in New York, and hanging out with the kids in New York, it was like they were runaways, or living on the streets. They were like getting bags of airplane glue and just snuffing glue until they would just get so many brain cells killed that they'd be like spaced up. They were doing such crazy drugs, like angel dust laced with their marijuana. And I was just like, you know what? This is nuts. This is more nuts. So then I heard the song Straight Edge. I was like, this is, that's what I am. I'm straight edge. But there was not like a straight edge scene. So when Youth of Today got together, we just wanted to start a straight edge band. That yeah, we were all straight edge. And, and then what happened was it developed into a whole scene. The Youth of Today got famous, we got to tour around a lot, and um, uh, Youth of Today was a straight edge, and we were vegetarian, and um, a little bit of a spiritual twist in there, and um, we sort of like, I, I feel like it made a difference because it sort of changed the face of that, that scene for a while. And then um, at the height of Youth of Today, I went to India. And then I became like a monk for six years. So I tried to write songs around spiritual principles and then I started the band Shelter. originally started in 1989 in Syracuse, New York. I had grown up um, listening to and loving um, 
all the punk bands and the hardcore bands from Orange County and New York City and Connecticut. You know, we traveled to support them and uh, we genuinely believed in the message. And we were, we were stunned and pretty shocked when like um, almost entire rosters of, you know, straight edge oriented or straight edge um, labels had all their bands sell out. So, you know, it, it definitely made us really amped up to do our own band. We felt like the, the torch was kind of being handed to us, you know, because the, the numbers were starting to, to die down. You know, there was less shows, there was less people involved. And I think it, it ultimately led to like a stronger breed of, of straight edge individual. Um, so I went from, from playing bass uh, with a couple of different friends in the band who passed in and out of it and eventually took over vocals when we got to like 91, 92. That's when I um, met up with Scott and Mike and Ben and uh, we recorded All Out War. And uh, the straight edge scene definitely um, started to rise. The scenes were coming back, people were going to shows, people were starting to take uh, straight edge to the next level as far as, you know, well, now that we've gained this clarity of mind, we can see a lot of the um, problems in the world for what they are and let's try and untangle ourselves from them, you know, as to how we saw animals being exploited or abused or the natural world being poisoned or destroyed. So there was also like an environmental and a, a animal rights aspect to the scene at the time. My name is Russ Rankin, uh, I'm 39 years old, I live in Santa Cruz, California, and I've been straight edge since I do a lot of stuff. I play music, uh, I'm a hockey scout, and part-time record producer sometimes. Uh, I used to be in a band called Good Riddance, and I'm in, currently in a band called Only Crime. As a teenager, I drank a lot. I got in a lot of trouble. Uh, I had to stop. And right when I stopped, 
uh, I was worried that I, because I was into punk rock and everything, and I was worried that I wouldn't be able to have fun and be into punk rock without drinking. And I met a friend who was straight edge, and she would, she and I would go to shows, and this was, you know, late 1987, early 1988, and coincidentally there was just a lot of music happening at that time that was all about not drinking and not taking drugs. And I sort of got swept up into that scene, going to shows pretty much every week and being with like four or five hundred other kids who who weren't fucked up and, and it was it was attractive. Like it helped me to it helped me to be able to stay involved in punk and stay involved in music without and, and it showed me that there was another way to do it without drinking and without taking drugs. Punk rock when I was getting into it was so nihilistic and self-destructive. Um, it was live fast, die young, it was just partying and drinking. And so what Straight Edge offered was, well, I could still listen to this aggressive music that I like, I could still go to shows and stage dive and slam dance, but I don't have to be fucked up all the time to do it. I don't have to wreck my family or my relationships, I don't have to end up in jail or dead on a sidewalk somewhere over it. So that was, that was, was attractive to me. Most of the people I know who are, are my age and have been straight edge as long as I have or longer don't call themselves straight edge anymore because they feel like it's, there's a stigma attached to it that wasn't there before. When I, when I got into, when I was first getting into straight edge there were crews but it was, it was a joke. Now it's not. Now there's people that are getting, you know, there's, every time there's a show there's fights. Um, and for what? Because you're from a different area code or, or you're not wearing the right clothes. It's definitely interesting to be in this day and age, to be like somebody who's been straight edge this long and seeing the music change and the whole landscape change and, um, and to, still, to still be sticking with it. And that the worst thing is that some of the people, some of the elements who I think are creating the stigma aren't even straight edge very long. So the whole movement gets tarnished. The whole lifestyle gets tarnished by people whose commitment was paper thin to begin with. It sucks. When I first got into punk, it was about 1983. It really could never be that way again. To, to think that it could be is naive. So the, the, only, the only thing left to do is to just see where it's going now and try to find a place to fit in or, or try to find a way to still enjoy it. Um, what frightens me is that if I was 14 or 15 years old right now, um, I don't know if I would be attracted to punk rock. That sort of frightens me because it's been my whole life.
Uh, my name is Kent McClard. Uh, I'm 40 years old. Uh, I've been into the straight edge thing since uh, 1983 or 1984, so I guess that's 24 years, 25 years. Um, uh, I run an independent record label and a record distribution called Abolition Records, uh, and I'm located here in Goleta, California. How I got into Straight Edge? Um, I, I came from a broken home, and I, I didn't have a lot of uh, guidance or rules about what I should and shouldn't do. And I was always in trouble, and I, people didn't, in school, I was a loud mouth, I hung around with the wrong kids, I didn't get good grades, and I wanted to decide for myself what I was, what I was and wasn't going to do. And so straight it just seemed like a natural thing to me. You know, I didn't, I wanted to make, make choices. I didn't want to have excuses for the things I did. And I really, there, I didn't see a point to it. So I had a lot better things to do than waste my time, you know, getting messed up. I, I, was, I was just productive. And to me, being productive was much more valuable than, than um, you know, partying or whatever. To me, just avoiding addiction was important. I mean, I'm an extremely addictive personality. And honestly, if I wasn't straight, I think I'd be dead. Um, I don't have self-control. You know, what hardcore offered me was the opportunity to define my own life. And that's part of what straight edge is to me, is this, this opportunity to make definitions about yourself in an active way. And so, you know, when I discovered Hardcore and I discovered Straight Edge, I discovered all these other possibilities that I could do things my way. And I, you know, I would, ne I would not be into Hardcore today if I had, when I got into the scene, if I hadn't have felt like I can do anything I want. And when the thing that, what the thing was so amazing about it when I discovered it was, I said, wow, there's this thing. I can do anything I want, and I did. I just started doing things. I did. I you know. I did the first show in my town. I did the first fanzine in my town. I did the, you know, whatever. I just did these things. I said I can do it. No one stopped me. No one said I couldn't. No one looked down on me. And I just, you know, I, I just started running. And that's what makes it important. I would get in arguments with people where they would be like, oh, that record doesn't matter anymore because those people aren't straight edge. And it's like, who cares? Like, you know, it, it, that record's not about the people that made it. That record's about your interaction with it. Like, you know, I don't give a fuck what people in bands did after I enjoyed their records. I only care about what their records meant to me. You know, I really don't care. Like, it makes no difference to me if somebody isn't straight edge anymore. You can't betray straight edge. I mean, that's ridiculous. There is no straight edge. It isn't a collective... I mean, it isn't like some thing. It's just an idea. You know, if you're into straight edge and then you change your mind, then you change your mind. And and if you set up a, a way of judging people that's based on perfection then everyone loses it's just a race to the bottom because you know we're all humans and we're none of us are perfect i mean if we were we wouldn't need any of these ideas or we wouldn't need music that expressed opinions because we'd all be perfect i mean <laughs> it just isn't the way it is <laughs>
My name is Bull Gervasi. I'm 33 years old. I live in West Philadelphia. So I work at a, a natural foods cooperative that's one block from my house that was established in the early 70s. It started out as a small buying club where a group of people just decided to get together and try and get food directly from a distributor and a few farmers uh, rather than relying on uh, chain grocery stores or corner stores that didn't really have much of what they were looking for. Um, the people that have keys to our uh, store 24 hours a day and the store's never been emptied. We still we're doing better business than we ever have and uh, we control it. We control how the stores run, what we stock, yeah, how we operate the place, who we get our supplies from, what farmers we're dealing with, all these different things. And uh, yeah, we bring in good quality food and try and sell it at the cheapest prices we can. I've been straight edge my entire life, but conscious of it since I was probably about 15 uh, when I was introduced to bands such as Minor Threat and Youth of Today and uh, a lot of the old New York hardcore bands uh, of that era, the like late 80s, early 90s. And when I was uh, about 14 years old, one of my best friends was killed by a drunk driver, which also had a really uh, tremendous impact on me. And then um, getting involved in the punk scene, whenever we had the chance we would come into the city and uh, there was a small record distro that set up at the shows and we would just buy whatever records we saw that had cool looking covers. And, uh, and I was really impressed by uh, the message that was with the records that it was like very positive. As I later figured out, this was called Posicore. And uh, I was like, this is great. It's really like interesting that you know, this new form of music to me also has like a pretty positive message and like is talking about vegetarianism or human rights or uh, politics or whatever. And uh, that really struck a chord with me. The most recent band that I played in is uh, a band called Rambo. We were together for about eight years. Um, the band was together for about a year and a half before I joined. I think in the hardcore scene in the U.S. there are a lot of problems uh, <clears throat> with um, yeah, the glorification of violence and uh, apolitical attitudes and uh, sexism and racism and uh, homophobia and just a general disregard for uh, politics or forward thinking in general and uh, I I feel like it's gotten worse in the past few years here uh, and that was kind of one of the reasons that Rambo uh, came into being. We played a couple shows and uh, had like some goofy props and like a mosh robot uh, and stuff like that and wore like uh, army fatigues and uh, it just kind of blew up. People were really like into the idea of like a band with uh, politics in their in their lyrics and their lifestyles and also but with uh, a sense of humor.
people who are 15, 16 years old, 17 years old, music is their life. And the idea that they can't go see a band because they're not old enough, this doesn't make any sense at all. I mean, to me, playing a show where you're not allowed, people under the age of 18 or under the age of 21 are not allowed in, is the same thing as not allowing women in, you know, or Asians. I mean, it's just like a, it's a significant part of the population that's been ruled out for, for what reason? Um, I've never played a show, knowingly at least, that wasn't all ages. Music is for all people. That's, that's clear. That's just clear. And I don't know why other people, whatever accept conditions that were set by an industry as insidious as the alcohol industry, why is music treated as sort of a sideline to like just a a party to like just getting fucked up. I just don't understand it. So anytime someone says to me, so you live the straight edge lifestyle, I think it's not a fucking lifestyle. Like partying, that's a fucking lifestyle. Like getting high, that's a lifestyle. Uh, being involved with religion, that's a lifestyle. But not engaging in substances to like change your way of thinking, that's just life. People use drugs or alcohol to cope with the coping mechanisms. That's a, that's a good way psychologists call these things. Ways to cope with some type of pain. Not just drugs or alcohol they use. Food, right? They don't have some feeling, some emotion they don't want to deal with. You eat a donut, it goes away. It's a quick fix. So people use food, they use drugs, they use alcohol, they use shopping. That's a big one. Shopping therapy, you're depressed, is shop. Sex is a big one. You know? If a guy's dating hundreds of girls, he's got some neediness or some emotional needs. But the real question is, is your coping mechanism actually helping you grow? Or is it tying you tighter to this world and making you miserable? And that's a question we have to ask ourselves by our, you know, by our choices. Straight edge are spiritual, they're actually spiritual principles. They're spiritual foundations. Because if you're taking lots of intoxications, it means you're not facing some emotions you have. So for me, the idea was some type of progression, and that's why I got into spiritual things, because I felt like, okay, I don't drink and I don't smoke. But even within that realm, I mean, you, I'm sure you know, there's a bunch of straight edge kids that are complete assholes. So what good is it? Does that, does that make me a great person that I don't drink or smoke? You know what I mean? But I like the idea of straight edge because I think it actually helps people. But if I'm doing it to prove that I'm better than you, that's just another ego trip. That's just another ego trip. So once again, it really boils down to, what's your intention on being straight edge anyway? Is it just to be cooler than everybody? I think really the intention is the whole thing behind this whole, behind anything. I always was terrified of the idea of uh, being out of control or being addicted to something. And, you know, I saw from uh, people that I grew up with, you know, skating, we all later got into more and more into punk. I saw them go down really hard, you know, and, and hit rock bottom after they, you know, went from, you know, alcohol to marijuana, which, you know, you always read about, it's called a gateway drug. It literally is a gateway drug. You know, then it's acid, then it's speed or whatever, and then people, next thing you know, they're into like, like the suicide drugs, you know? Drugs are even more accepted now. They're not just seen as like a, a chemical rite of passage of youth anymore. Um, it's, it's been very mainstreamed and normalized. I mean, the drugs are harder, they're, they're more addictive, and they, you know, take people down harder, even quicker. For instance, like, you know, crack, meth, heroin, all that stuff is, it's, destroying people's families, it's destroying people's lives, and 
some people say, well, why don't we just legalize them and then the cartels and the narco gangs wouldn't be waging wars. There's a lot of poor people who, um, you know, feel very trapped and very helpless in their situation. And I think to throw drugs into that and just stir it up would be th the worst thing possible. When there's a problem that seems difficult to solve, you shouldn't just walk away from it and throw in the towel, you know, because then there'll be even more addicts and even more street crime and even more children being neglected or, you know, people run over in the street by someone who's under the influence of one of those substances. Um, in October 1997, we learned about uh, what the fur industry calls pelting season. Now this is a period of time, it's about one to three weeks in November, where every single animal on every fur farm in the country um, is executed, every mink, every fox, and they're killed, sold, sent out to the auction house. Um, in, in October 97, we went, I remember um, the uh, specific meeting where we went to the University of Washington, we went to the union, student union building, sat on the couch in the lobby, laid out a map and planned out a two-week road trip that was going to be our attempt to get as many of those animals out of those fur farms as we could before they were killed. And the next day we got in a car and started driving east. And when this two-week period was over, there was somewhere between eight and 12,000 mink running, running free across the Midwest. Now, according to police reports, every single one of these raids followed the same model. There was no property damage. There was no claim responsibility made. There was no message left behind. The farmers simply woke up in the morning and found all their animals gone. Um, as a result of these actions, at least two of those farms had to shut down. And I think that anyone that's ever done these things will tell you that those are the kind of results that writing letters will simply never, ever accomplish. And there were things that we saw... My name is Peter Young. I just turned 30 years old. I live in California. And at the moment, I'm on a speaking tour uh, discussing my experiences in the animal liberation movement. And I've been straighter since 1994. It's very, yeah, being a straight edger in prison is one of the more uh, unique experiences that you will ever have in your life because people think they know the drug culture, they think they have an idea what it is. I mean, you're, you're deep in it. You are in, literally immersed in drug culture when you're in prison. Um, I think statistically in federal prison, 80% of the people in prison are uh, uh, in for drug offenses. Um, now, the people that are not in for drug offenses generally are also drug addicts. So you're talking about... Um, you know, when you, t you try to tell people, you know, I haven't had alcohol or drugs since I was six, 16, 17 years old. I mean, this just actually blows their world. They can't even con conceptualize of not participating in drug culture because they're so deep in it. Straight Edge to me has always been about staying young. Um, because what is staying young? Being young, let's look at a kid. Put that kid in a room with a, with a block or a piece of paper and a pencil and that kid will have a blast. It doesn't take any kind of stimuli for that kid to have a fun time. It's simply being creative. Being young is being creative. Um, and as you get older, all, why is it that it takes more and more to keep us entertained? More and more and more. And that's, I think, one of the main reasons people slip into drug and alcohol use is we simply cannot entertain ourselves. We stop being creative. We stop figuring out how to have fun in every situation and we resort to drug and alcohol use. Um, Hardcore is not just simply about having fun. If all we're doing is having fun, and we're here to just mosh it up and go home and feel good about ourselves, and like slap our bros on the back of the show and just feel the brotherhood and have a great time, if that's all hardcore is, then hardcore is a fucking joke. It should be about um, what you take from the hardcore scene and go out in the world and do. 
And um, straight edge kids had a profound impact on the animal liberation movement in the 90s, and all, frankly, to the current day. Um, but you know, you'd show up at demos um, in the mid 90s, 95, 96, and they look like hardcore shows. Every single person was wearing, you know, the One King Down hoodie, you know, the Earth Crisis sweatshirt, or what have you. So um, straight edge was activism. Yeah, there's a, a tremendous uh, conservative element in the vegan straight edge scene because there's a lot of people out there that are going to fight tooth and nail if you try to tell them that being vegan is simply not enough or being vegan in the hardcore scene is simply not enough. So to those people, I would say, you know, you know, get a clue or get the fuck out. My name's Priyush, um, I'm 19. I'm a student here at UC Santa Cruz studying uh, environmental studies specifically. Um, and within that field, I'm concentrating on conservation biology and a lot of like social issues that tie into that. The LRDP is, is uh, named after the Long Range Development Plan, that's what it is for short. Um, that plan here at this campus that's in Santa Cruz is to eventually eradicate um, 120 acres of mostly redwood forest up here in, in the northern part of campus, right where we're standing. But we're still protesting that because what's going to be there is a biomedical science facility. And at that facility, they're going to start doing shitty things like uh, animal testing. They're going to have a whole basement dedicated to a rodent vivarium, which is going to do just that. And the rest of the floor is going to start doing uh, nuclear research. The rally here on Wednesday was to gain primarily student support to get to get out the knowledge out there about what this plan exactly is going to do. So our goal right now is um, just to, to, to show outreach and and that rally was a form of outreach and in the end we found out there's uh, tree sitters up in the spot where the biomedical facility is supposed to be built. Hopefully it shows that the university that we're not going to take their plans for expansion. Uh, Trash Orchestra is a, is a DIY uh, music collective, I'd say. Um, you know, we just collect different types of trash, you know, trash lids, like water jugs, you name it, tin cans. And we just pretty much start playing. And uh, having something like Trash Orchestra at these rallies, such as for the LRDP, really gets um, the crowd pumped. Uh, it, it, it pumps a lot of energy into them, and, and, and that's the kind of spirit we need in these types of movements. Um, I haven't feel, felt any uh, physical aggression or discrimination based on my skin color in, in the punk hardcore scene, uh, which I think is great. Uh, feeling secure in a scene is something that's vital, especially in punk hardcore.
Sometimes I feel like uh, I'm on the outside, but when I see other colored people there, although they're not the same ethnicity as me, uh, I feel pretty comfortable. But um, being on the East Coast this summer was different, especially when I went to Boston. Uh, I was like the only like brown kid there, you know? It's like, this is really awkward. My name is Eva Jeannie. Um, I'm currently living in Santa Barbara, California. I just moved here about a week ago. Um, I'm 24 and I've been straight edge for 10 years now. I came from a really small town and there were no other punks, no other hardcore kids, uh, no straight edge kids for sure. And my brother and I were really starting to get into punk and we got into minor threat, but we also were drug free because you know our our mom struggled with addiction, and we saw her life kind of go to hell, you know, because of drugs, and our family kind of torn apart a little bit. Um, to me, I don't know. I have a lot of reasons for being straight edge. Um, one of the most important ones, I think, for me right now is. Just recognizing that you know you don't have to depend on substances to have a good time, to deal with your boredom, your depression, your pain. I think it's really important to be able to really experience all the highs and lows in life. I think it's probably the only way we can really grow and learn from our experiences instead of running away from them and trying to escape through intoxication. There's no doubt that the straight edge scene today is male dominated. It's, yeah, like obvious when you see the amount of people in bands, the majority are men, and at shows, the majority are men as well. Um, and I think that's because, you know, there's always sort of been a lot of misogyny in the hardcore scene and that tough guy mentality, and that does turn a lot of people off. and women are made to feel uncomfortable a lot of times it shows just from sexist attitudes and it's not necessarily always so blatant but more you know just the attitudes people have and the way they overlook females or discredit them or judge them harder and feminism is not just a women's issue it's something that affects everyone and the end of patriarchy would actually be beneficial to everyone you know keep us out of those two narrow molds that we're born into and let us experience 
the broad range of emotions that we're all capable of experiencing. We just don't allow each other to for fear of being ridiculed or whatever. Um, but um, I think, you know, there's definitely women doing things like being in bands, booking shows, making zines, and doing things that, you know, men can do. And I think that's awesome and it's inspiring. And I know when I see a woman in a band or something, it makes me feel good because we're so underrepresented. And yeah, I think just get out there and get involved and um, just have your presence be known so that it'll just get easier and easier for women in the future to, you know, be part of the scene and not constantly have to prove themselves or be judged harder, you know, just because of the fact that they're a girl. That would be awesome. I don't accept it as a movement. Um, doesn't mean that people who do, I think, are dumb or wrong. Or anything. it just means that I don't. I just don't. I see people as people. It was always, in my mind, celebration of an individual's right to choose his or her life, like way of living. Problem with movements is that movements start to lose. I think quite often sight of humanity, like human beings, individuals, and I think in straight edge. People who really pushed the idea of a movement, especially a militant movement, really lost sight of human beings. I don't want people ever to use my words ever to injure anybody, ever. That is the antithesis of my desire in life. I think it's unfortunate that this minority of people who've engaged in fundamental and violent behaviors have gotten so much attention and have put such a stigma on it. But it is a reality. And the only way that they're really fueled is by supporting the notion that their cause is a just one. I just think that's a bunch of bullshit. Like when I think about people say, well, how do you feel about the fact that so many people emulated you? I think, well, at least I didn't write heroin. There must be some gangster rap guys who have some serious trouble sleeping at night. Can you imagine writing music that results in murder? That just is insane. That's why I find it so disturbing when I hear about real serious ugliness and it somehow votes straight edge. It really bothers me. It's just totally the opposite of anything I would ever would have I ever would have won. But if I wrote a song saying, shoot the motherfucker in the face, and people do it, then I would I don't know how that person can sleep. I think people, they, it's like they're living in a movie. They just don't think anything is real. But shit is real. I remember once getting out of a car. I've been driving. Fugazi was playing. and Got out of the car at a gig. I've been dri I was doing all the driving. I did, I'd driven like six hours. We got to this gig and this really young kid ran up to me. And I had a, some iced tea or something. And he ran up to me and he said, this is the first person who talked to me. He said, Whoa, you're drinking iced tea. I said, yeah. It was like this unsweetened iced tea. And said, yeah. He was like, well, my friend says caffeine's a drug. I said, oh, tell your friend, fuck you. Like, I just don't give a fuck. Like, that's just not polite. And can you imagine how many motherfuckers have asked me if I'm still straight edge? I had a kid yesterday ask me on the phone. It just drives me crazy. I really have nothing to do with the straight edge scene or music scene for that matter anymore. If you talk to anybody that's not from the straight edge scene, like just a civilian, they'll say they've never met a bunch of arrogant, 
judgmental people th than they've ever met in the punk and hardcore and straight edge scene. They're judgmental about how you clo how you dress, with what you wear, with what you do, with what tattoos you have or don't have, with what type of music you like. Who cares? Who cares, man? How can you be progressive, alternative thinking if you're always pointing the finger at somebody for selling out or um, not being true or not doing enough? It's like judgmental people, they're just bitter and angry and truthfully they're more angry at themselves. They have some self type of hate and they project it on the whole world. And to anyone who's sane, they can step back and say, oh man, you got some real serious issues. There was some time that um, I was in Italy and I had a glass of wine. Why? Because I couldn't care less, you know what I mean? It was at a time in my life, I was like, whatever, 36 years old. I was in Italy at a glass of wine. So some straight edge evangelists were just like, you know, Ray Kappel has sold out everything he ever believed in, you know. And I just felt like, and so anyway, it became a real subject of contention. The fact that so many people cared made me realize whatever the scene is, it's a little nuts. It's a little nuts. It's a little fanatical. In any like progressive community, and I think why there was like maybe a failure in a straight edge community was, if there was a person that was straight edge, but it isn't anymore, or was straight edge, but maybe they stopped for a while and then, you know. I mean, for the most part of my life, 20, over 25 years, I've been pretty, I mean, you can count on, you know, how many times I've been ever, not even get drunk, just like even sipped, you know, some wine or whatever. But it was sort of like, um, in any community where you sort of ostracize people, instead of like, sort of like, treating that person with love or sympathy or friendship even, not even sympathy or, but sort of like, but ostracizing that person? What kind of community is that? What have you created for yourself? We definitely promote the drug, alcohol, smoke, and promiscuous sex-free lifestyle through Straight Edge. And I think those things are only gonna make someone's life easier. They're only gonna make it more enjoyable. They're only gonna remove barriers. Um, you know, the last thing I want is for people to go out and get themselves in trouble. Like, for instance, in Syracuse, there was almost never any fights at shows in the um, 90s or the beginning of the new millennium here uh, because there was a, a genuine unity. You know, kids were supporting the bands, bands were supporting each other. Uh, the scene was kind of a, an oasis from problems at home or problems at school or work where like-minded people could come together and celebrate shared beliefs and vent out their aggression and their their depression at the same time like whether they were you know singing along to like a high energy band or, or dancing hard it was a release
My name is Pat Flint. I'm 22 years old. I sing in the band Half Heart. Um, we're from Boston, Massachusetts. I first heard of Straight Edge when I was really young. When I was like 12 or 13, there was a there was a newspaper article on MIIs and uh, Ten Yard Fight and just Boston Straight Edge in general. Um, my mom actually introduced that to me. So as a very insecure, you know, stereotypical 12 or 13 year old kid, I, I, I wanted to belong somewhere. I didn't really fit in at school. I didn't fit in at skate park because I sucked at skateboarding and, and whatnot so you know I, I I found straight edge is like you know a cool sense of you know belonging but as time went on it became much more than that and if you're gonna consider yourself straight edge it's gonna be for it like a lifelong thing and it hit me you know so I've never really associated straight edge as like you know some type of uh, movement or anything like that you know I just I've always just seen it as like you know like a personal movement, you know, like a something that I, I I have for my my life to help me, you know, you know, revolutionize myself and you know, be, help me become a better person. Uh, you know, Boston is a huge uh, college city. There's a college at like every corner, um, and you know, it, it does seem often that you know when when kids get to college they they just break edge. In college, there's a lot more freedom, and you can really do whatever you want. There's not not that many uh, there's not that many like you know punishments for that or anything like that. So you know that's very tempting to you know be able to go drink or do drugs or whatever and not really have to worry about like whether or not your school is gonna get get you in trouble or like your parents are gonna get mad. I remember I, I actually had to go to the hospital. Um, the first week of my college because I, I was sick and then there was this girl in a wheelchair. It was a Thirsty Thursday is what they call it. 
around here is like on Thursday nights, kids just go out and just get fucking wasted. They go to all the clubs and they come back to their school and you know they're they contemplate how bad badly they've injured their their liver. But anyway, so I, I'm walking out of the the doors at the ER. The doors open and there's this girl in like a wheelchair waiting, just waiting in to go into the ER. And she she's clearly highly inebriated. Her head falls down, she pukes all over herself, and then she falls out of her wheelchair, just covered in puke. And and the people and like the nurses and like everyone just didn't give a shit because they see this stuff so often. Just every Thursday night, there's just a new idiotic college kid, just you know, being a fucking moron and just wasting like their their nights and whatnot. So that was a interesting thing to see my in my, my first week of college. You know, to see this fucking wasteoid just like being a stereotypical like cliche and I've never wanted to be a part of that My name is Ross Henfler. I'm an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Mississippi. I'm 33 years old and I've been straight edge since I was 15 years old. So gosh, it's been 18 years now. Well, I had actually started drinking alcohol in around sixth grade when I was around 12 years old and I got involved with some friends who really, it was their mission to get drunk on the weekends. And so it seemed to me that my friends and I spent a good part of the week figuring out how we could acquire alcohol uh, and, and then get drunk on the weekends. But that never really felt comfortable to me. I always was a little uncomfortable uh, drinking too much and I really just despised the taste of alcohol. And finally, when I was in high school, I was 15 years old, and I was sitting in my Spanish class, and there was this kid sitting across the room who had big black X's marked across his hands. And I was immediately intrigued. I thought, what, what is going on here? And so I introduced myself to him and asked him, what are, what's with the X's, man? And he said, oh, I'm, I'm straight edge. Well, what's straight edge? Oh, that means I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't do drugs, and I don't engage in promiscuous sex. I thought, wow, that's, that's pretty different from most of the people I hang out with. And so he invited me to go to a punk rock show, and I did. And it was just this chaotic melee of bodies flying across the room and this loud, obnoxious music that I couldn't understand the words. Um, but there were a lot of kids there with these X's on their hands and X's on their shirts. And I just felt at home. And so the, the bands, the, the, the people in Straight Edge and Hardcore that I get most excited about, most inspired by, are the people who, who want to change something in the world beyond their little scene. I want all of you, if you have one, 
to take out a dollar bill. If you don't have one, that's okay. If you have a, a, a bigger denomination, you can take it out too. But especially if you have a dollar bill, take it out. Just kind of look at this money for a minute. Just kind of, I don't know, just, this is something I don't normally do, you know? I don't normally look at it. It's, it's just a piece of paper, right? Interesting, huh? It says, in God we trust. All right, well, let's think about that a minute. Do we live in a world where it's in God we trust, or is, do we live in a world it's in George Washington's we trust? That's not a fair question. Now, those of you who have a dollar bill, the next step, there's one more step. I want you to tear it up in itty bitty pieces. <laughs> This is actually against the law, but I'm quite sure that you are not going to be busted. Uh, you can. Don't rip this one up. Wow, wow. Uh, isn't it weird to think about? Like, this is paper. <laughs> you know, it's literally paper. And yet the power that it does sort of have, the symbol. Now, some of you might be thinking, now oh, wait a minute though, Ross. You could have donated that dollar or you know, something. You could have done something good with that dollar. And isn't that sort of a mark of privilege to be able to sit in front of a class and tear up a dollar? Uh, reasonable thought to have. But there again, that. I think reinforces the idea of the power of money because it's like, oh, how can I make a difference in the world? Money. And you all know there are many ways to make a difference in the world besides money. Don't get me wrong, I write out a lot of checks. I love my job. Um, being a sociologist is fantastic because you can put sociology of in front of anything and you have a new thing to study. My own interests are mainly in the sociology of youth subcultures, social movements, and gender studies. And so when I teach, I don't just want to fill my students' heads with a whole bunch of theories. I'll still teach theory, but I want my students to leave thinking, what, do I, what can I do in the world? What can I think about, and, uh, about how to change the world? And that comes from my punk and straight edge roots. One of the things I tried to do in my book is consider whether straight edge is a social movement. Most of the people who are involved in straight edge don't consider themselves necessarily part of a movement. When they think of a social movement, they think of groups like Greenpeace or Sierra Club or the Civil Rights Movement. They don't think of this, this more subculture that they're involved in and the music scene that they're involved in. But I, I, my research, I guess, showed just a little bit uh, of a different take on that. I actually think that straight edge is kind of a form of a movement, even if it's not out to change government policy or something like that. It's more of a movement about challenging culture, challenging people's lifestyles. And there's no leader in straight edge. There's no membership list. People don't pay dues. Um, you know, there's no set guidelines or rules beyond the very basics of not drinking and smoking and using drugs. But at the same time, it's hard to deny that something that has been around for over 25 years and has affected so many people around the world and keeps going and keeps issuing kind of a challenge to youth culture, there's just no denying that there's something powerful about the collective aspect of that. So one of my conclusions was that we sh should maybe consider straight edge as a movement, even though it looks on the face of it like a style subculture, a music scene, that there's something a little bit more to it.